Hello and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Yuri van der Sluis, who is a specialist in playbook production and helping organizations to scale. Yuri, would you mind giving us a quick two, three minutes on your background? Thank you for having me on your great uh, podcast. Uh, first of all, it's uh, fantastic. Uh, I'm really excited. My name is Yuri van der Sluis. I have a B2B sales background, so I used to be a salesperson, B2B, mainly in the IT sector. And I've been training and coaching salespeople since the start of 2006. So I've trained about 15,000 people, 200 companies, mostly in Europe. And my philosophy always was try to be radically relevant to the clients or prospects that you're working with, try to truly make a difference and don't see sales uh, just as, a, as another profession or getting rid of your product or service or truly make a difference. This is what I've been emphasizing on in my trainings and coaching and consultancy. And the last two years, I've been specializing specifically on creating sales playbooks so people and companies are ready to scale. So what are the most common questions that managers and owners ask you about playbooks? There are a few elements here. The first problem that they have is they the, the sales team usually consists out of a few or like a handful senior salespeople that have their own process, their own approach, which is not transparent. They don't know what they're doing. And they're, they're being left alone because they, they come with the big deals. They have their own network. So it's not transparent. And then you have the more juniors uh, and, and, and they need to be onboarded, but there is no process. And everybody sells the way they think is best. So the biggest problem is if you don't know what's working, you cannot repeat it. Only when it's transparent, actually how you're selling. So they start with, Yuri, can you train the sales team? Or can you uh, help us uh, to increase conversion rates or do need analysis or negotiation? And while we're talking, then it becomes clear to them that uh, what they're actually missing is a very thought out sales process and a sales strategy and engagement in every single step. Because there are still a few companies that, have, that haven't done that properly. I mean, the most, they, they have their sales process in their CRM, but these are you know, uh, first uh, call, qualification, need analysis, proposal, negotiation, close. But, you know, that doesn't mean anything if you don't make it very specific what you actually mean, how does a need analysis actually look like? Well, so, they, they, yeah. they, do, they do have a system. Uh, it's called Hope and Pray. And yes. it goes something like show up, throw up, quote and hope, sell and run. So yeah. I, I, nice. I get that. I mean, yeah. that's been my world for the last 17 years. Yeah, so sorry to interrupt, but Marcus. You know what I think where this actually comes from? Because I think this is really interesting. The majority of the VP sales or the sales directors used to be salespeople themselves. So if you think about where, where they used to come from, they were being drilled usually an activity level when it was still allowed back in the day. You know, it's a numbers game. So they were drilled to fill out the CRM properly, to make, you know, it's a numbers game. And then as they grew and in, in, into more senior roles, they became so successful. They were so good. They didn't have to bother about thinking about CRM because it's in their, in their, their own DNA in their system. And then they didn't have to worry about the numbers because they have built up so much experience and intuition and self-discipline that they, they didn't need anybody to tell them what to do. Because, you know, I'm already 30 or 35 or 40. Nobody tells me what to do. I bring in the numbers. And as they become a sales director, they actually project what they like or what they don't like to the others to the rest of the sales team. So even though they may not need it because their self-discipline is extremely high and they were really successful because they were really good salespeople, now they think they don't like micromanagement because they don't like it themselves because they outgrew the whole micromanagement. So now suddenly they want salespeople that 
that manage themselves because suddenly this micromanagement, everything that is in relation to this is what I expect you to do on activity level or in quality level, it's now put under one pile that they call micromanagement. And most sales directors are so allergic to it because they outgrew it and maybe they don't need it. But the biggest mistake is, is they project their personal preference to their entire sales team. And this is where I think they make a huge mistake. I, I couldn't agree more. And I'd like to pick up on a couple of things. First of all, sales is not a numbers game. Yes, you have to do a certain level of activity. But if you're playing the numbers game, then chances are you're throwing an awful lot of shit at the wall and hoping some of it sticks. And you're confusing action and activity. Activity doesn't pay off. Decisive, intentional, uh, meaningful action will. Second thing, just because it was done to you doesn't mean that you should do it to your people. And we see this happen an awful lot where managers and uh, sales directors and VPs of sales and CROs do project how they thought they think it's done. And so they claim that they're autonomous and that they're leaving their people to do their job. Actually, they're managing by abdication. They're making the excuse that they don't want to micromanage and therefore relinquishing their responsibility to do their job well. Because managers only have four functions in my book. Hire the best people, then get the best out of them. That means pre-onboarding, onboarding, training, coaching, and accountability with consequence. Make sure they have the tools and resources they need to do their best work every day. Not overburden them with a whole pile of crap that is designed to help the audit function function, that is designed to provide hundreds of useless reports that no one does anything with because we see managers being overburdened with pointless reports and reporting. And no one uses that big data. Or what they do is they keep doing the same old shit every day and they keep saying, pound the phones, follow up on those leads and close those deals. And so there's no real contribution. The other thing that I see happen a lot is managers who go out there on ride-alongs with their salespeople, and they puff up their chest and say, Yuri, son, look how it's done. And then they're going to do it for them. And yeah. there's no knowledge transfer because they don't have a learning culture. And then the fourth function of management is to help clear roadblocks and protect them from uh, acts of idiocy from their own leadership. And again, a lot of the time they don't do that because they play a political game. And the net result of that is they recruit experienced salespeople who have one year's experience 20 times over, who then consistently fail to produce. And then you blame the salespeople for not having a proper onboarding process, which means that you set them up to fail anyway. And all veterans, as well as junior people, need to go through the onboarding process. And all people in sales need to train. You don't see people like Roger Federer or, I don't know, uh, Messi, saying, you know, sod it, I'm pretty good at the moment. I don't need a coach. These are people at the top of their game who have several coaches. So, Yuri, tell me this. Why do you think that culture is allowed to persist? I think there are a lot of reasons here, but I think you touched upon uh, a very interesting topic. So I think sales directors, they have like two buttons. Either they leave the sales people completely free and they just manage results because they believe it's all about autonomous, you know, just let them do their job and I, and I manage the results. And then when the results are not good enough or somebody in the organization wants to go for the data, suddenly they, they flip to control and then and they go into the activity level, but dumb activity level. But I think what they're missing, they're missing the point is there is a middle ground here. It's not about control. It is about understanding what is the best process, the best way to have sales conversations, the best way to do lead follow-up. So that means that you, you need to be willing as a culture 
to make it extremely transparent what the actual process is and what those sale, what, how a sales dialogue actually looks like. Now, if I'm a senior, it feels like, come on, this child stuff. You know, what questions I ask, who cares? You know, I, I, I know how to do my job. So it feels childish because it's not introduced from a growth mindset, an improvement perspective. If it's control, then you feel like, well, am I in, in, an, in a kid's class all of a sudden? How to ask great questions? I've, got, I've done 15 years under my belt. I'm not going to do that. But if you're not going to do that, what the five key questions are, it means nobody can learn from you. You stop challenging yourself and you don't create a culture whereby you look at from a generic perspective, looking at one level higher if you are sitting with a prospect and if you just reflect upon it, what is the, the, the best way to approach it? Is it? Are you going to look for pains? Are you going to challenge your prospect? Are you going to inspire them to look at the future and talk about the trends? Are you going to focus on the actual needs now? There are so many routes to go to. And if you don't make it very transparent what those scenarios are and how it looks like, you basically allow these salespeople to just go along with it and improvise and, and, to, and, and to rely on their routines. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not. But you know what? Nobody knows why because nobody is going to analyze it. Nobody's going to, to draw lessons from it. Now, if you, this is a podcast about scale, the best way to scale is to understand uh, on a very deep, profound level to understand what are the common denominators of the buying personas in different customer segments so you can recognize the type of buyers and the process they go through with those playbooks that, for the most part, is a great guideline and a framework to follow. If nothing is documented, the only thing you have is what you remember from training, which is usually 10%, 20%, or even less if it's, if it's six months uh, earlier. I love uh, your optimism. You know, yeah. <laughs> but it's very low. So it's, it's, uh, you just go a lot, you wing it. It's a shame because uh, I think if we really come prepared, so you mentioned Messi, he's still training. And a football team, they have a, they have a strategy, they have a formation, 4-3-3, three, three, and with every team, they adapt and they, they will create a new strategy. And so they know, how do we play against teams that are very uh, on the fence or attacking, they play open, they play close, the fast, slow, Italian, doesn't matter. So they have different systems and different strategies. They strategize all the time, all the time. I know very few companies that can create an open culture to look at the process, not just at the results. We have the results. Okay, what is your pipeline? How many deals? What are you going to commit? You know, every, you know, only on the results. And you got the dumb activity level. Just, you know, I want to know how many proposals. It's just numbers. What they're missing is the third part. And that's the actual selling. And I think with playbooks, this is where you can make the biggest difference. But there's one prerequisite. You need to have an open culture that is driven to learn from each other, not from a control perspective, not from judging good or bad, just to make the entire team smarter. Because if, if scaling means hyper growth, means you're going to hire 10, 20, 50 salespeople, 100 salespeople in the next 12 months, it means that that process needs to be completely clear and transparent and it, it will keep evolving but if i have a framework this is how we sell this is our strategy not just some copy paste what everybody's doing in the market this is our strategy so that every, that is the biggest uh, biggest opportunity right now every one of the sales leaders i have interviewed who is leading or has led a hyper growth technology business and we're talking about 300, 500, 1200% annual growth compound. In UiPath, we're talking 100,000% revenue growth in seven years. We're talking about companies like Thycotic going from 10 to 500 million in five years. Now we're talking about Splunk going from 42 million to 1.2 billion in five years. Every one of them 
has a process. They have structure. They have a framework. They have playbooks. They are religious about CRM hygiene to make sure that they know exactly where they are. And managers have a process and a framework. And leaders have a manage, uh, a framework and a process. So, so Marcus, what, has what, what an do operating you think? Rhythm. Yeah, so why do you think that these hyper-growth companies have this all in place? You say religious in CRM. They got their, their playbooks. And if you go to companies that may with 20 or 30 million and they are not hyper-growth, but uh, maybe a little bit lower, uh, lower pace, how come they find it difficult in your mind to adopt this same belief? I think it's down to the speed of the leader determines the speed of the group. If the leader's not open and has a growth mindset and they fixate on doing what was done to them, or they're afraid to enter into constructive conflict and they're afraid to appear as if they are micromanaging when they're absolutely not. If you look at the leaders of those fast, super hyper growth companies, they have real clarity as to what they're trying to do. If you look at Tom Shodorf's operating rhythm, he has um, stuff in there to inspire, to guide, to communicate, to review, to coach, to develop, to align, to recognize, to enable, uh, to give feedback, to make sure that top talent is aligned with future needs, that they're in sync with HR. He understands what the geographic forecast looks like. He understands what the geographic pipeline looks like. He knows where the top deals are. He knows how the general communication is working. He has strategy in place and a playbook, which is constantly reviewed because it may, it may have been fit for purpose uh, six months ago, but their business is rapidly changing. They have in place things like approach to improve execution, to improve morale, to clarify purpose and expectation to develop employees, to share purpose and expectation, make sure there is ongoing reinforcement training, there's formal development and career planning and career pathing, identifying current and future recruitment needs in order to ensure that they're staying ahead of the curve and they don't end up in a traffic jam, creating greater clarity in the forecast and eliminating gaps, reducing risk, improving their execution and alignment, accelerating revenue, revenue expansion, uh, making sure they're aligned with the customer, aligned with the partners, uh, defining their strategy. Now, th that doesn't sound to me like someone who's winging it. Um, it sounds to me like someone who has clarity on why they are there, because their function is to get the best out of their sales team. Their function is to ensure they are ultimately accountable for that P&L number. And yeah. they understand that whilst they are accountable, individuals within their team are responsible. And that responsibility is taken incredibly seriously as well. Now, what uh, Tom said was they would have knockdown fights behind closed doors as a management team. And then they would agree a course of action, make a decision, and then everybody would back it. And part of the problem here, I think, is ambiguity at the top leads to politics at the bottom. So you look at all of these organizations, the ones that really managed to attain a relatively smooth upward tra trajectory, it's never perfectly smooth, but the, a relatively smooth one, understand that conflict is essential. They don't mind having fights. And no, they it, it depends on what you fight about. It depends on what you fight about. Constructive, of course. constructive yeah. conflict. It's got to be constructive. It's a, it's a strive thing. for excellence. It's the fights, what the, the best way to approach it. It's not a fight about ego uh, yeah. or uh, power. No, it's, it's all about purpose and which uh, direction to go to. There's one yeah. other critical point, yeah. which is everybody from the bottom to the top in the organization is receiving and delivering coaching. So juniors are being coached by people above them, which allows the more senior salespeople to learn their craft of moving into management. The ones who don't do the coaching or the mentoring tend to be top producers, but they're not the ones who should move into management. Tom no. Shodorf and Ryan Longfield 
and uh, Chris Dudridge and all these guys who are absolutely at the top of their game are receiving coaching. They seek out coaches. They have multiple coaches. They're not so up themselves that they think that they're the finished article. And when I was talking to Tom, he was quite emotional about this. He said, I know I'm not the finished article. And what I need to know is that I can always get better. And they're always on this road for constant, never-ending improvement. This is the growth mindset. Yeah. This is a growth mindset. You cannot have a culture of growth for the rest of your company if you don't embrace it yourself. This is uh, what uh, what uh, true leadership is about. I was thinking, just from a more macro perspective, why is it that these uh, these hyper growth companies tend to adopt this this growth culture and to have all this in place? And usually, my playbooks actually cover a large part of it. That there's no confusion about the components that you mentioned earlier. I think it's when you're in hyper growth, so you got a great product, you got great marketing, and there's a lot of money behind it and finish series C and it's just, okay, now is the time. I think they cannot afford not to have a process. Otherwise, it's complete chaos. So also out of necessity and uh, the, what the shareholders are expecting, what the, what the leadership is expecting, you have to put it in place. Otherwise, it's pure chaos. You, you just can't manage it. So um, if you think about it, if you are a company that's about to enter into that stage or you're trying to seek out that growth, you can still implement all of this. You don't need the risk of chaos as a driver to then just embrace this type of culture. You can, everybody can still do it today. And this is, I think, where more than 80% of sales teams are, are not taking this opportunity. There's too much emotion involved or who's right, who's wrong. I think they're they're completely missing out on this opportunity. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Can you imagine an engineering team or a finance team run in the same way that most sales teams are? How quickly would those companies be bankrupt? There's no excuse for it. We claim to be a profession. Act like professionals. You need to have these systems and these processes. And it's not about micromanaging. A manager's secondary job after hiring the best is getting the best out of your people. Just abdicating uh, responsibility and saying, well, you know, I've hired uh, experienced veterans. They're all grown ups. Don't want to interfere. Don't want to get it in their way. That's an act of idiocy. You look at the military. We're not talking about, I'm particularly thinking about special forces. If you've got a bunch of conscripts, yeah, you just drill and drill and drill, and uh, you go through that process. But actually, in, in special forces, these people need to be team players and interdependent. They need to know that other people in their team have their back. They are highly trained, highly specialized. They're constantly training. And you know, one of them is worth 12, 20 uh, conscripts. And you see the same thing with A players, you know, an A player is worth anywhere between three and 12 times a B player, and a B player is worth three to 12 times a C player. That could mean an A player is generating 144 times as much as a C player. But what people focus on is the coverage, making sure that you've got warm bodies in the seat, rather than recruiting the right people. You know, the rule is better no breath than bad breath. And the problem is that people don't ask the question, is he better than an empty chair? And often the the answer to that question, sadly, is no. And often if you ask that question of managers, the answer is often no as well. We did a research study that came out in spring, and it suggests that only 6% of sales managers are fit for purpose. That means 94% are not. That's a travesty. But it's borne out in the results. You see 13% of sales teams globally hitting their quota. Only 44% of individual sales reps in 2019 hit their quota. One in eight first meetings result in a second meeting. If that isn't a red flag that says there is something wrong with the way your salespeople sell, I don't know what is. You look at the conversion rates, 60% of sales cycles and in no decision. Yeah, it's probably okay. higher now in these times, yeah. Well, 
certainly the research that came out last year was 60%. Now, 40% that are left, of those, 74% of those go to the company that has a process that displaces the incumbent and disrupts the current uh, the status quo. The other 10 point, whatever it is, 10.4% goes into bid where you have a one in four win rate. That means on average, if you are a company that chases bids, you will win one in 38.5 buying cycles. That's a 2.6% conversion rate. Yeah, and Without think about the time kind of investment. Wow, that's just well, th- crazy. Think about this. There, there is an old proverb in English, which is you cannot polish a turd. Okay, <laughs> What you can do is you can roll it in glitter and it'll still look shiny, but it'll stink. And yeah. that's what most sales processes are. It's a genuinely devastatingly depressing state of play. And yeah. I hope that if nothing else, people are woken up to the fact that they should go back and look at the actual buying cycle started to converted, not just the tail end, because most of you are sinking hidden costs in your buying and your selling process and you're allowing buyers to control your profit and loss account. You touch upon uh, so many interesting insights, uh, Marcus, fantastic. And I think But we shouldn't forget that uh, actually right now it's a pain. Process is a pain. CRM is a pain. It's seen as a a hygiene factor and it's boring. And can we just do our job? It's it's for for a lot of people, if they think about it, it's not the most sexy thing to think about. However, it can be truly inspiring. There's so many companies I speak with, and then I ask them, what is your elevator pitch? And they they don't have one because everybody just uh, has has their own way of introducing the company or or even the value proposition. What is your value proposition? They all say different things. And some that do have it, then I ask them, okay, who are your buying personas in a DMU? Uh, Somebody from purchasing or the head of IT or the, the user. How would you describe your value proposition specifically for this audience? And then they they have to think on their feet because they have not written it out for a buying persona or part of the DMU, what their value proposition is. DMU for people who don't know the acronym. Yeah, sorry. So decision-making unit. So if you would sell to a 20K deal or a 50K deal, uh, it's rarely just one person that decides. There's a there's a group involved, and they're they're the usual suspects. Maybe there are three or four key people with different positions in the company that also decide whether or not to choose for you as as a vendor. As a great salesperson, you know you have to include those stakeholders not only for decision making but inside the process to understand what are their needs and. How would they evaluate your product or service? And what are their interests? Obviously, because if you don't include those stakeholders, then you're part of your, your, your huge number that doesn't convert. So if you're going to include those stakeholders, what is your value proposition for them specifically? Now, there are only a few companies that actually take the time to think about, okay, what is our value proposition? Bring the people together. So this is what, what is always included in playbooks. But if you don't have it, then what they do, they just, they just copy-paste their messaging to all the people in their entire process. So you know you're not resonating as much as, as you could. You're losing out. Well, to that point, account coverage is a major, major gap. Our research on this is very clear. If you're selling to companies of fewer than 200 people, then there are typically 3.43 influencers in the buying decision. And the average coverage is 1.72. And this is across a thousand different respondents. Yeah, so there's um, a gap. Yeah. Then between two and 400, 4.85 influencers, and the average coverage is 1.75. Between 400 and 1,000, 5.81, and the average coverage is 1.9. And this is the really telling statistic. Over a 1,000 people in the organization that you're selling to, the average number of buying influences is 6.5. And the coverage by salespeople drops to 1.65. Now, when you consider the cost of pursuit on an enterprise sale, 
you could be getting 40, 50, 100, 250 grand, a million dollars to pursue those opportunities. And that lack of account coverage is one of the biggest indicators. And it will show up in your playbook that there is a gap there. It will show up in your CRM. But if your management is abdicating responsibility, and it's not about, about command and control, it's about taking responsibility for doing your job well, then that will tell you where you need to look. Now, I, I'm working with a number of tech companies at the moment, and this is first one of the first areas w- that we look at uh, when we look at their pipeline, because they don't have that coverage. And then we can see which deals are at risk. Then when we miraculously focus on getting that coverage within the next 90 days, those deals move forward and they start bringing in six and seven, seven figure deals. And it's done in a, co- a compressed time frame uh, because now what they're doing is they're making sure that not only are they lining up all the right people to have the right conversations on both sides, but what they're also doing is making sure that they are tailoring their message specifically for the individuals and their job function and those archetypes and personas in order to ensure that it's relevant. Because the thing that everybody in the company is experiencing is a shared experience of their problem. But how they experience it will be different. And the drivers will be different. How they are measured, how they are scrutinized will be different. And this is why you need process. Systems set you free. They liberate you because you can be as creative as you like within the system, but you have to have that framework. I spent the first 17 years of my career fighting systems and process because I thought somehow, immaturely, it constrained me. The reality is when I discovered the Sanders system and I had that method to follow, within that, I could be as creative as I like. And it is isn't a genuinely creative act to constrain yourself. I did a stand-up course last summer. And the thing that worked when you're writing jokes is constraint. It's not just rambling off on one. It's learning how to cut out all the fat and just make sure that you've got the bits that you need to, to do the setup and then the punch. And the problem is that you, people don't think like that. They think that somehow sales is an art. I disagree fundamentally. It, it is, to a large extent, a science based on repetition and drill and practice. And that means that you have to have, as part of your playbook, pre-call planning. You need to then rehearse. My rule of thumb is for every minute you're in front of the prospect, a minimum of three minutes of rehearsal. Now, that means you do less activity because you're spending a lot of your time in productive actions in rehearsal and preparation and planning for all the different eventualities. So when you're in front of them, you're not having to think on your feet. The occasions where you do have to think on your feet because something comes out of left field to hit you on the head, you've got breathing space. And you, what you don't want to do is trigger your lower brain function where, because your amygdala gets fired off and suddenly you go into your midbrain or your reptile brain. You want to stay on purpose. And the problem is that most salespeople think that it's okay to do that kind of stuff. It's not. It's absolutely not. And I I fundamentally believe it is an act of gross misconduct and a fireable offense to turn up to meet the chief executive or the chief financial officer without having done a pre-call plan, without having done your rehearsal time, and without doing a post-call debrief. I think that managers are remiss where they are not taking their salespeople to task. And I think it comes down to the fact that managers want to be liked instead of be effective. Yeah, exactly. And maybe they they are uh, like you were, that they don't like systems and processes because they they think in personal, just, you know, your charisma and and your, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's all about people. And if you like each other, this is when companies buy. Of course, if people like you, It helps. If they don't like you, they will try to avoid to do business. Of course. But there's so much more. They have to trust that you have their best interests at heart. And you know what the hell you're doing. If you just turn up and you wing it and you show up and you put your market stall out and you fire up PowerPoint and you torment them with presentations about your (laughs) company headquarters 
and how long you've been in business and who your investors are and who, which of the, their competitors you do business with. What on earth are you thinking? No one gives a damn. That's like yeah. photos of your ugly children to strangers. So, uh, so Marcus, you've done stand-up. Well, very badly. I, 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 <laughs> I didn't manage to make the cut for the show. And the following day, my 13-year-old daughter at the time said to me, Daddy, a lot of people ask me, do you want to be like your dad? And I say, no. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I'm funny. Um, so um, she's the stand-up comedian in the family, not me. <laughs> that, that, is, that is just great. Um, I, just I, 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 this day, um, she's, she's being sold into working yeah. in me sweet now. Yeah, so maybe it's interesting uh, to, to just spend time uh, on uh, sharing with, with our audience of the feedback that I receive uh, after implementing these playbooks. Because there is always some natural resistance because people are afraid it's, it's control uh, because there is no system and, and process enough. Uh, so when you introduce this, then salespeople are afraid. They're like, oh, no, it's, it's not against, you know, somebody thought of something. So you have to onboard this properly. You have to introduce this properly. You have to go back to talk about your sales philosophy and, and your purpose. It's, uh, it's exactly what you mentioned earlier in the beginning of this podcast. When, you know, there should not be any ambiguity Yeah, on the top because that creates confusion and politics uh, below. So it has to be clear. Now, it's so nice after implementing these playbooks when you get feedback from, from sales that it's finally clear and written on paper and implemented in a process that it also gives some comfort that there is no confusion how to go about this and you know what, what is truly expected from me. And... Uh, how can I engage? And suddenly you see the seniors, when, when, when they change, that they can actually contribute to the playbook. And suddenly it becomes a, 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 growing, a growing library of sales insights that they can implement and reuse again. And now it's something they share. So before it was something personal. You have your products, prices, your systems, and how you sell it. It's, it's up to you personally. You just have to, to meet the company guidelines a little bit, but who cares? But now it's something completely different. And the reason why I all started this, my purpose is I'm coming from, I used to be a salesperson, a manager, and then I became a sales trainer and coach for the past 15 years. And I realized that the percentage of people that actually implement whatever is trained is so dramatically low that I thought to myself, okay, I'm done with just training without a fundament. I need a structure. I need to make sure that if, if I walk out the door or close my Zoom session now, if, if, because a lot of it is uh, virtual right now, then I know that at least everything falls into a, a structure and a strategy and an approach and a methodology as opposed to just, you know, uh, in the air. That's why most training doesn't work. I mean, honestly, you'd be better buying lottery tickets and spending money on most corporate training because, first of all, it's not structured. Secondly, uh, even if it is structured, it's not reinforced, which means that there's very little uptake and it's quickly forgotten. And the other part of the playbook, which you touched on, is that it needs to be built by the people who use it. It yeah. can't just be imposed. It needs to be something that evolves organically. And as their market changes, as their customers change, as they grow and they're selling into different types of companies, the playbook needs to evolve and get richer through the input from the lessons from the field, from the lessons exactly. that customers teach. Exactly. Um, and th this is the thing that really frustrates me because I fundamentally believe that there is corporate deafness majority of corporations do not spend anywhere near enough time actually speaking to and listening to their customers. I interviewed yep. a fascinating lady called Amy Brown, who runs a, a startup, a scale-up company called Authentics, and they specialize in the American health system. What they do is they use hmm. AI to capture the free-form conversations in the call centers. So customers are actually telling them what they need to do how they get frustrated, what they find difficult about dealing with them, the things that they want in the future, the impact 
that the work that they do is having on their lives. Now, the problem is that often they, companies rely on survey data. Now, surveys are terrible for the simple reason that no one fills them out. You get 0.8% response rates. That isn't a representative sample of your customer base. That's a fraction of your customer base, probably either very strong uh, views in a positive or a negative light. And they're people whose time you've just wasted because they've had to call your call center. And yep. then at the end, you're asking to waste more of their time by filling out one of these surveys with the dropout rate that's massive. You need to speak to your customers. Marketing absolutely needs to speak to your customers, but marketing very often doesn't. They operate, operate in a bubble. Senior leadership needs to speak to the customers. Jim Legg at Phycotic has conversations every day with their customers. Tom Shodoff has conversations with the customers every day. And what they're doing is they're listening. And I have a managed service provider client, and the CEO, uh, relatively new to the job, has started having conversations with the customers. And what she is bringing back is golden, absolutely golden. They're finding out what the customers love about them, but also where they need to develop and also recognizing the gaps in terms of their offering, but also where they're offering stuff, but the customers had no idea about it because the salespeople were going in and transacting. They weren't focused on the longer term, the strategy. And sales organizations need to remember that customers come to us for leadership, for a safe pair of hands. And if you do your job well, you become a partner. Mm -hmm. And this comes back to the issue of trust. They don't have to like you. They may get to like you later and you get to play golf with them and you know, be godparents to their kids and go to their weddings and funerals. But the reality is they have to trust that you have their best interests at heart. They have to have faith in you for them to keep coming back. And there are so many companies out there that have loyal customers who stop spending. And yeah. that's a bitter, bitter irony. Because if you've got customers who love you, but they've just lost faith because you've deviated, because you haven't listened to them. Yeah, that's it. That's a great, great example. I always say there are, there are two main things uh, uh, you need to make sure that the potential buyer can experience from you. That is your integrity and your competence. Because you can have people that have a high level of integrity, but they're just not competent. They don't understand. They don't have the skills or the intellect or they just can't do it. They're, you can trust them by having the good, uh, good intentions, but they just can't do the job. They got other people. They may be competent, but if they don't have a high level of integrity, maybe their main interest is, is on their own side. And maybe they have other customers that they prefer or or spend their time on. So you want those two things, high level of integrity and a high level of competence. And I think this is the trust that, that you speak about. I wrote a book about trust. You know, trust me, I'm a salesman, where a trust is such an important topic, especially in times of crisis or in times of uncertainty, or when there's so many vendors, so many people, so little time, where should this trust come from? Well, th this is really important. Earlier on, I talked about the 60% of deals ending up in status quo and the 74% going to of the remaining 40 uh, going to the company that can disrupt. What they also need to be able to do is demonstrate categorically what the cost of staying stuck will be. So the cost of inaction. But this is the key. They need to be able to create enough white space, enough difference between what they are offering and the status quo and all the competitors, if they can't create that white space, then the natural inclination for the buyer is to stick with what they've got. And yeah. uh, they need to also to be able to head off the anticipated regret and blame. So this is where trust and competence come in, because they need to be able to tell the hero's journey story from one of their customers' perspectives. And you've got to remember, you are never the hero in any of your sales stories, your customer is. Because the minute you make it about yourself, then you get between the prospect and their decision to buy. But if you make it all about the customer, someone just like them, and how they had their initial reservations, they went through some ups and downs, they struggled, and you know you were in peril. And then you, know, you managed to find your way out of it. And you as a seller 
or you as the vendor organization were the guide. So you're the Obi-Wan Kenobi or the Yoda to their Luke Skywalker. And nice. you have to be able to tell those stories. And that's where the playbook can come in because the playbook will be filled with these kind of stories. Yeah, the with, the right, with the right story. Not some shitty story that is uh, dumped on the website with uh, lots of uh, gen generics that you know, doesn't and technical mean information. anything. Again, I, one of the things I've been doing with my clients is I partner up with a guy called Alex Mosco. He's an old client of mine. And he's the best sort of storyteller that I know to be able to tell the customer's story or, or your story through the customer's voice. And it's incredibly powerful. When you compare the case study that the company originally has, which is talking about you know, an implementation of Azure or uh, Office 365 or Teams or whatever, versus the story that comes out from the customer and how it affected their ability to collaborate, how it improved their ability to communicate, how it created transparency within their organization, elevated their ability to perform and deliver to their customer. That's a very different message. And the problem is that so often marketing collateral is produced to feed the desires of technical people who can only say no or maybe, not the people who can say yes. And the salespeople don't understand that the critical skills in selling, I believe, are planning an organization. They are listening, really listening, not only for understanding, but also so that you can then ask questions that deliver insight. You have to be customer centric. So the customer is front and center of everything that you do. And your mission is what the customer needs and wants. And your purpose is how they want it delivered. And you have to be focused on the long term. So you cannot be transactional if you want to create lifetime customers who are loyal and keep buying and bring their wealthy friends as customers. Now, if you lack any of those, and also you lack empathy and compassion, because I think these are things that are really important, then you become just the transactional machine and you will be replaced by siri you'll be replaced by the internet because you're irrelevant your thoughts completely agree we're touching uh, upon so many interesting topics here i like the word empathy that you use especially if you combine it with the word distance empathy is uh, yeah. also something that i mention a lot of times Because if you do all those things that you mentioned, planning and preparation and asking questions or whatever it needs at once, I think that uh, the, the biggest skill as a salesperson from a business empathy standpoint, of course, empathy on a personal level, but if you, if you understand, if you can tune in and, and empathize where, what a company is going through and what they need to, to make the next step, to create that white space, as you mentioned earlier, If you can create the business empathy to, so to replace, uh, to put yourself in the shoes of the customer and not just, uh, you know, come with these questions, okay, what do you want? And just write it down. And it's, it's, you can only challenge your, your prospect or your client. You can only increase the number of stakeholders. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the 1.6 and the 1.75, all those statistics, only if you have a high level of business empathy. Because if, if, if a client or prospect doesn't feel that you actually understand their business and you can come with such sharp observations and mirror what you see, what you think, what they should need, so you can challenge what they think their own requirements are. Because if you, if you can only follow what, what people say they want, then the only thing you do is you, you become an order taker, but just you know an intelligent order taker. As a client, you want somebody that doesn't accept the, the, the status quo or the, the set requirements and show how their product fits great in, in what they're looking for. No, you have to challenge what they're looking for, but not for the sake of challenging. So you need such a deep level of business empathy to come up with these questions because uh, I know you've seen these statistics as well, you know, Gardner that talks about, I think 70% of the major B2B purchases Customers said that their, their actual purchase was difficult because it's difficult because it's, it becomes increasingly more difficult to 
to find internal alignment. So if I'm a, if I'm a salesperson, if I speak to my client, I shouldn't just take those requirements as they're set in stone. It's just one perspective because you know the moment you'll speak to others, there will be slight differences. If a client feels that you can empathize with their business, you have a high level of understanding of those requirements and what they actually need and not only what they're looking for. Now you're becoming a, a, a team member to help to, to create partner. this internal alignment. You're a partner. That is what a partner is about. But this requires a lot from a salesperson. It absolutely does. And it requires that you are committed to the, uh, helping your customer, not helping yourself. It requires that you challenge them. And it also requires you to have the vulnerability to say, you know, I don't know, or with a wrong organization to help you go and speak to our competition. They're better in this area. That builds your credibility. I think it also points to another factor, uh, which is that most salespeople put the customer on a pedestal and yeah. um, they don't exercise their right. Yes, sir. To yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and you as a seller do not conceptually see yourself as their equal, then you're automatically at a disadvantage. And what you will then do is fail to serve your customer well, because you will be uh, try you'll be afraid to lose. So your uh, most sales organizations that I see are playing not to lose instead of to win, and it gets even more complicated when you're operating in a channel environment. So I interviewed uh, my old account exec from 18 years ago, a guy called Graham Woff, who is one of the world's best enterprise salespeople. He is stunningly good. He's just closed a $100 million deal where there were 12 partners. Now, that is effectively a, a strategic exercise in managing a complex system where all of the moving parts are difficult because they're human beings uh, and making sure the right people are having the right conversations at the right time. But he made himself the ally of the partners by understanding what strategic value they are trying to deliver to their customer and aligning himself with that. Net result of that was he took six to 12 months off the sales cycle because they introduced him to the board, which he would never have got in as an independent vendor. And the second thing that he did, which was genius, was he created a cheat sheet for the CFO when they were trying to explain why they wanted to go down this road. And uh, the, the CFO then came back and said, thank you for the cheat sheet. It made all the difference. And you, this comes back down to this business empathy. And I want to make a distinction between business empathy and buyer empathy. Okay, Business empathy is a good thing. Buyer empathy is a bad thing. Buyer empathy is where you suddenly have a little voice in your head that says, oh, this is a bit expensive. Or if it were me, I'd probably want a discount. Or you jump through hoops that don't need to be, uh, that you don't need to. Uh, you start answering unasked questions because you think you need to educate them. You don't. You sell today and you educate tomorrow. People don't need to know what they're buying well, in, in the deep technical sense. They need to understand that you have a solution to their problems and you need to earn their business, you need to earn their loyalty, and you need to earn their faith. And these are things that we forget because we're so fixated on hitting our own target and transactional selling. And managers putting pressure on people to meet their targets in the short term and at risk, uh, putting at risk the long-term relationship. I have another client who's, bear in mind, he's 220% of quota, okay? He's the highest performing salesperson in his territory. And his boss came to him and said, we've got a problem. Your quote rate is too low. What do you mean my quote rate's too low? I says, well, um, you know, in line with everybody else, your quote rate is much lower than everybody else. But I'm 200%, 20% of target and ahead of everybody else. And you're asking me to spend my time dishing out quotes when currently I have a 90% conversion rate on the quotes that I send out. Yeah, but we need you to focus on quotes. I mean, what on God's earth are they thinking? 
Um, and the other thing that they did in his case um, was because the rest of the team was behind by 23 million for the quarter, they were being told, do anything you can to bring revenue in this quarter because their private equity masters, idiots, okay, are more interested yeah. in the quarterly uh, result than they are in creating the long term. So yeah. they, were being, they were being told to give 80% discounts. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's it in this terrible. So, so what happens then, you're, you're educating your client that your prices are not your real prices. And it's not about value, because if you start dumping your stuff, then value is not the emphasis, but it's uh, your, your low price point. And you're educating your client to keep on negotiating, because apparently your prices are, you know, are, are there, there is no, no system behind it. It shows desperation. And if they're not ready to buy, this, this, this is one of the... the, the, the and that's the, the point. You know, so if they're not ready to buy, you dump. So if you've done everything well, now you start dumping. So when they are ready to buy, then suddenly you, you, you didn't bring in the revenue earlier. And when they are ripe, when, when they are ready to buy, you just threw away for no reason all this potential revenue because you've earned it. You've done all your jobs so profit, well. Profit. That's yeah. the important thing. It's profit. It's not just yeah. revenue. It's actual yeah. profit, yeah. 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 which exactly. means that you can spend it. If it was just revenue, you couldn't yeah. spend it, but you're giving 80% of profit away. Yeah. So, so uh, what, one of the jobs uh, in 2005, I was working for BT Global Services as an international business development manager for large outsourcing deals. And I know that uh, in Q3, I think they, they missed some, some revenue. So they had all these uh, schemes we, we had to follow. And I went to my sales director and said, that, you know, I'm not going to do it. You can find me, but I'm not, I'm not going to do it because in Q1 and Q2 next year, I need my deals. And I'm not going to kill my deals to, to right now, you know, I just dump my pricing because I know they're not ready to buy. I know they're in a pipeline, but it's, it's, not, it's not time yet. So I'm not going to hurt my Q1, Q2 and burn all this profit. I'm, I'm not going to do it. You and can fire me, but I, 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 I refuse. I refuse. Yuri, if you had a golden ticket and you could whisper in the ear of the idiot Yuri, age 23, what advice would you give him? I think I will remain an idiot until, the, until my last, uh, last breath. But if I, if I would give advice to my 23-year-old self, I would say uh, to trust, to trust uh, your instinct more, to become an entrepreneur faster, don't follow the masses. I think uh, it took a long time for me to choose my own path. And uh, even today, it's, it's uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, as, a, as a growing company, decision-making is, is, is one of the most important things. Uh, if you know, you, you're also for you, as an entrepreneur, it's all about autonomy and believing in your own path. And as a 23-year-old, I was uh, looking for affirmation, confirmation, you know, I, I needed the pat on the shoulder that, that I was good and yeah, you, you, you do it well. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to shine and to be, to be vocal and, and to show and, and, and uh, to keep our thoughts and, uh, to ourselves that you don't want to rock the boat. And I did rock the boat plenty of times, but I wish I, I would have done it more become an entrepreneur faster. So I, I think this would uh, be my advice. Trust that whatever it is that you want in life, it's for you. It's fine to make uh, mistakes and don't hold back. Absolutely. And again, you know, failure is your best teacher. And I think the part of the problem there is how people conceive of failure because they see it as a personality defect instead of an opportunity to grow and learn. And I think if you're not failing frequently and you're not failing fast, then chances are you're not growing. And this is why I see so many people who are veteran salespeople who really haven't evolved because they haven't taken the risks. They've played it safe not to lose rather than to win. 
So I have a mantra right now because I'm, as an entrepreneur, I'm launching all these new playbook services and it's still a relative new thing. Uh, sales playbooks is becoming more and more popular uh, and hiring people and onboarding new clients. Uh, I would say, okay, as a young company, we have to screw up forward. We're moving Absolutely. forward, but you stumble forward. There is no such thing as, as perfection, but we shouldn't stop executing either. So you have to screw up forward. So as long as you move forward, it's fine. You just move forward and learn. Obviously, you know, you shouldn't make mistakes, the same mistakes over and over again, but screw up forward. So that is our mantra right now as, as we're growing. Excellent. So Yuri, what are you watching, reading, listening to at the moment that you think is really good? Yeah, so I, I listen to a lot of different uh, podcasts. Actually, Brian Burns uh, from the, the Brutal Truth, uh, I follow as well. But a book I'm reading right now, I actually really like it. It's called The Selling is Hard, Buying is Harder. Uh, it's by Garen Hess. Uh, he's the owner of Consensus Software. It's a great book because it touches upon such a... Uh, uh, so so many things that are that are relevant right now, and I like the idea. Selling is hard, but buying is harder because it it puts the entire mindset and focus of the salesperson from a buyer's perspective. And and, and I think you know it's all about alignment and, and putting yourself in the shoes of your buyer. So I lo I love this book. It's not uh, widely known. I think he's published it a few months ago, but look it up. Garen Hess. Selling is hard, buying is harder. It's on my reading list now. You might want to look at the work by a guy called John McTeague around a buyer journey mapping, which is yeah, really nice. interesting. That's okay. fascinating. And McTeague is M-C-T-I-G-U-E. What are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with at the moment? Right now, I have customized my promise to my clients. As you can see here in the back, uh, we, we customize sales playbooks completely for our clients. That means that everything is fully, fully customized. And, and I love customization because that's where your relevance is the highest. However, and it is, sorry, just yeah. very quickly, is it customized just to the vendor or is it customized for the customer as well? So for my client, for so for the vendor. So so I make their their entire playbooks completely customized because it's their product, their their markets, their dynamics. Their average deal size, uh, their competitive landscape. So okay. everything is unique. But because everything is so unique, it means that it is not easy to standardize my own processes. So it means it's uh, it's a lot of work. I like it because it gives a lot of purpose and a lot of satisfaction to, to, to finally deliver these playbooks and get it implemented because I, I, I love the fact that that's so much value so i i think it's truly inspiring otherwise i wouldn't launch this proposition this company but the biggest challenge is to standardize myself so the moment i've scaled up enough uh this is the moment i will put in more more templates and more replicability and repeatability in in my own proposition but i'm not at that stage yet so I, I find it. So that's my biggest struggle that I, it takes a lot of effort right now to deliver the value. And I don't mind, but I know that from a business standpoint, I need to standardize my company if I want to reach the next stage. Excellent. So again, eating our own dog food here, yep. you know, having systems and processes in place that can be replicated. Yeah, so absolutely. Valuable lesson there. Okay. How can people get hold of you? Yeah. So. You can go to salesplaybook.pro or on my LinkedIn profile, Yuri van der Sluis, van der Sluis. So people can link with me. You can find me on Amazon. Trust me, I'm a salesman. Uh, but most importantly, around playbooks, uh, go to salesplaybook.pro and uh, I will be very interested to, uh, to see how I can help a listener or anybody that wants to, uh, wants to brainstorm or learn more about playbooks. Excellent. So, Yuri, thank you so much. Really appreciate your being on today. Uh, thank you for having me on, on your podcast. I really enjoyed it, uh, Marcus. Me too. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off from the Inquisitor podcast. If you would like to be a guest or you know someone who would be a guest, then please email me at marcuskauke at me.com 
or marcus at laughs-last.com. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And the subscribe is important because then you'll get notified whenever we uh, produce a new one. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.